Father Murr. And a hearty good afternoon to you, Robert. Great to see you. And we've got a lot to talk about today. It's July 11th, 2023. And we're talking about the latest moves of Pope Francis, which many people are depicting as a big change as the final stage of his pontificate comes. Yeah, that's the way I took it. Yes, and I think and anybody, everybody that I know took it that way too. So first of all, we have the appointment on the 30th of June of of Archbishop Fernandez as the new head of the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith. And we have then the departure from Rome on the 1st of July, uh, the exile really of Archbishop Georg Genswein, the secretary of Pope Benedict XVI. So we have one man coming in from Argentina and he was in Rome, and there's a picture of him we have. Uh, yeah, Archbishop Victor Manuel Fernandez, named Prefect of the Vatican's Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith on July 1st, 2023. And the next picture, Pope Francis with Archbishop Fernandez at the Vatican on June 30th, 2023. These are the two Argentine Catholic theologians. One is our Pope, and now his right-hand man in the Vatican will be this Victor Fernandez, who has been a rector of a university in Argentina up until now. And uh, it's not such a good photo of the Pope. Uh, the next slide is of Archbishop Genswein. Do we have that? Oh, no. These are, oh, I'm sorry. We've got two Vatican journalists who have written articles about the these recent events and the appointment of Fernandez. We'll be talking about that. And then we have Archbishop Georg Genswein with Pope Benedict XVI. Pope Benedict XVI passed away on the last day of last year. January, uh, December 31st, 2022. Robert, was was Archbishop uh, Genswein assigned to a place? He was told to go back to his diocese in Germany and that no specific task at all was given to him. He was supposed, supposed to, to consult with his local bishop. Incredible. That's incredible. Yeah, he had been at the side of the Pope throughout his pontificate for eight years, and then at the Pope's side for another 10 years as he was emeritus and until his death. So for 18 years, he was right at the side of the Supreme Pontiff or the emeritus Supreme Pontiff. And he had had three meetings with Pope Francis to try to decide his future in which he might have been given something in Rome or some other uh, task, but he has no task at all. He ranks archbishop. He's an archbishop and he's told to go home. Yeah. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's amazing. That's yeah. amazing. It, it's, a, it's a strange uh, paradox that the, yes. apart, the apartment that, uh, that he is asked to leave now, and he had to leave it on the 1st of July, he, uh, it was a large apartment in the old Doma Santa Marta, which is a, bell, uh, a dwelling behind the St. Paul VI audience hall next to St. Peter's Basilica, where some 20 cardinals and archbishops live. And it's the building next to that is the Doma Santa Marta where Pope Francis lives. And the apartment that was given years ago three, five years, seven years ago to Archbishop Genswein had been the apartment of Archbishop Viganò. Mm. And uh, it was a meetings in 2016 when Archbishop Viganò returned from the United States. He met with Pope Francis and Pope Francis said, I would like you 
no longer to stay inside the Vatican. I'd like you to give up your apartment. And Vigano had understood that the apartment really would be for life. So he said, well, is there something else that the Vatican has outside the Vatican, somewhere in Rome? And uh, the Pope said to him, no, I don't want you in Rome. You're not going to stay in Rome. Go back to the north. It's pretty, it, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty clear that uh, he has no time for people who... Uh, he has no time for people he has no time for. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It's so. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. And so that apartment was turned over in 2016 to Archbishop Genswein, and then who, 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 who also had a little room over in the convent monastery uh, several hundred yards away up in the Vatican Gardens where Pope Benedict was living. And probably spent more time up at that convent than he did in his apartment. But since Pope Benedict is that died, the Is that the, the Tower of St. John? No, it's not the Tower of St. John. It's called the Mater Ecclesiae Convent. Oh, I see. It, okay. had been, it had been for many years a group of nuns under John Paul II. And uh, when Benedict retired, he asked that it be prepared for him. And it, there were uh, even construction done in the months before his resignation to, pre to prepare it for him. Yeah. So it's, um, it's the beginning of a new stage in the doctrinal office and the end of a stage of Pope Benedict XVI and his secretary, who was what other journalists have called exiled from Rome. On the first I think I think that's a fair term, Robert. I think that's a fair term to use. It was exiled. So then, uh, just after that, at the same time, this man, Archbishop Vigano, announced that he was founding a new foundation to help support canceled priests and and small convents of nuns, particularly contemplative nuns, and it's called Exurge. Domine, which is a Latin phrase meaning rise up, O Lord, rise up and defend your people. And he's created this with a nobleman in Florence, uh, an, an old Italian noble family, Catholic family. And his first task is to try to raise one and a half million pounds for a new convent for a group of about 10 Benedictine nuns who are being uh, forced out of their convent near uh, south of Florence. Yes. In, uh, yes. And uh, so he's created a foundation in Italy as a nonprofit to do this. Then uh, there, there's a copy of the book that I wrote. That's me, Robert Moynihan. And... Uh, I went for at the end of 2019 after the archbishop was revealing so many things and everyone was saying, why is he doing this? And why is he not in public? Where is he hiding? And I managed to contact him, went to go see him, spent several days with him and then wrote this book. You can easily obtain it and I think you'll be interested to read it. And uh, this is a picture of the College of Cardinals uh, gathering together. And the Pope then on Sunday, two days ago, on the 9th of July, decided to add 21 more members to the College of Cardinals. That will occur in September, on the 30th of September. And people have asked me if anything should cause that celebration not to occur with these men who have been named still be cardinals and I have replied if as I understand it uh, the celebration is what will make them a cardinal they'll be created cardinals on September 30th so if anything were to happen before then they would not be cardinals so um, and this is uh, one article about this uh, this new uh, 21 names 
And uh, this is by a, an Italian journalist, a friend of mine, Andrea Gagliarducci. It's his analysis how to interpret Pope Francis' choice of new cardinals and what his conclusion is uh, that he has armored the College of Cardinals. Yes. With, with people who are in keeping with uh, his vision of what the cardinal should be. And uh, just so people will be brought up to date, many people will have heard of all this, but this is the ninth consistory Pope Francis has called, and yet it could very well be the most important. Uh, in June, there were 121 cardinals with the possibility of entering the conclave, and nine of those were created by John Paul II, 31 by Benedict XVI, and 81 by Francis. Of these 21 that he's created now, 18 are under age 80, so they will be new cardinal electors, and so he, he will add those to the 81 he created in recent years, and he will have 99 of the cardinals in the College of Cardinals have now been created by Pope Francis. So the total, the total amount of cardinals who can vote is what, Robert? Well, the, the, the limit was set at 120, but it changes because cardinals die. And in the past, they've exceeded it a couple of times because uh, people turn 80 now and go out of the voting number. So at this present moment, there will be, um, there will be I think, 139, 100, 121 plus 18 is 139, which is quite a large number. It's above the 120 that was set. As yes, a there, was a, there was a 120, which the idea of Paul VI created that, or decided on that number, maintaining the, the number 12 for the apostles yeah. plus, by 100, right? Plus 100, okay. So he's gone, he's gone far beyond that. Yeah, but there will be already, even by the end of the year, a, a, several um, dropping off the list. So it will drop down into the lower 130s. But you are correct. He's, this will be the largest number of cardinals wow. that we've ever had in the church on September 30th this year. Yeah. Oh, there's the third paragraph. Between now and the end of the year, another seven cardinals will turn 80 and lose the possibility to join the conclave. Versali, right. Comastri, De Rosario Sandri, who's an Argentine, uh, Yoam Su Jung, John Zerbo, and Juan Luis Cipriani Thorne, who's from Lima, Peru, and is famous for being an excellent basketball player. He was a very tall man. Um, well, that should come. That should come in handy. <laughs> well, these men will drop off the list, so it'll be 132, and during. 2024, another 12 Cardinals will turn 80. So by the end of 2024, we'll be back to 120. All right? Well, yes, that, that's that's saying that the Pope is still alive. Exactly. And that's, yes. another, that's another thing everyone is watching and thinking about because the Pope three times... So in other words, Robert, let me just see if I understand this because I'm, I really, uh, uh, I'm not sure of this. I've asked this a couple times, but I never got a clear answer. Should uh, should uh, uh, Papa Bergoglio uh, go to God this evening, for example? The new cardinals that were named are not eligible to vote. Is that correct? That's they correct. cannot vote until they're officially made cardinals. So the naming is nothing. Okay. I see. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Why they may name them several weeks before, we are now really eight weeks before. Uh, actually, more than that, we are, uh, I didn't think of it till just now. Three more weeks in July, four plus four and a half weeks in August, so seven and a half, and four weeks in September is 11 and a half weeks. It's almost three months. Before the it conference. used to be, it used to be that the that the cardinals who were the 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 bishops or archbishops or even priests, as a matter of fact, because it, 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 many times there were or lay people, there were lay people who were cardinals also. 
but but they but they were not named until just a couple of days before the ceremony, and they they knew it privately, but they were they were uh, to maintain the secret of it. Uh, mm -hmm. That was that was the whole idea. But this to announce uh, far in advance is uh, uh, kind of new. All right. Yeah, I, I think this is the longest uh, that I I could check from the moment that cardinals are announced to the date of the consistory. We could do a little research, but I think this is the longest lead time that I've ever seen. Usually. So, so what do we make of all of this, Robert? Well, we make of it that in July, early July, midsummer of 2023, Pope Francis has made some important decisions and decisive actions to uh, cement the things that he's been trying to do throughout his pontificate and to try to ensure that, that, that his legacy will be maintained. And uh, so that's the, that's the main point. The, the other issue coming up is that right after September 30th, in Rome from the 4th of October to the 29th of October, uh, there is a synod of bishops on synodality and the names of all the representatives to that synod were just released last week in Rome. And there's going to be 250 or 300 people gathering, many cardinals and bishops from all over the world, many lay people, quite a few priests, and uh, among those priests is Father James Martin, who is one of the leading um, advocates for a kind of inclusive pastoral care of LBGT Catholics. That's, that's quite a surprise, huh? Nobody was expecting that. So this, this, it seems that the church is on the verge of taking positions about these moral issues, which more traditional Catholics are afraid will be a departure from our tradition, and more progressive Catholics are very, very interested in achieving because they feel that our tradition has been oppressive and uh, immoral in some way with regard to many people in these circumstances. And this debate has been going on for years, and the German Synod and the German bishops have been uh, facing this, and they had said they want to give a type of church blessing to homosexual couples who have gotten married, bless them marriage. And the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith had written, no, we, the church cannot bless such a relationship. Uh, it can pray for the people, it can, it can love the people, but it can't bless such a, a relationship. You know, Robert, many years ago, when I was a young priest in Mexico, uh, a young man came and approached me at the parish and asked me to give a blessing to a knife. Mm -hmm. This is this is a true story. A, a knife. Well, I, I blessed cars and I had blessed ponies and horses and farms and everything, but I'd never blessed a knife. And I asked him, why in the world would you want a blessing for a knife? And he said, because he was going to use it to kill someone. And he wanted it blessed before, before he, he stabbed the person to death. I said, we couldn't do that. He said, why? And I said, because we can't bless a sin. Isn't that sort of what's happening here? When they're asking for a blessing for, for uh, a union that is still considered a uh, grievous sin? How can that be? Well, you're raising the, the precise question. And the answer, I, I suppose, is that there's a theological belief among some of these people that all of human life is so intertwined with sin, with sinfulness, that there is no one who could receive a blessing. And really, I guess they're saying uh, we have to include blessings of, of people who are 
in objective states of what traditionally was called immorality because the, the human heart and the human person is so filled with sensuality or so uh, with egotism or with uh, um, selfishness that uh, these sins can no longer be regarded as excluding them from some type of blessing. So uh, let me just add something to that uh, that was kind of interesting. Right before we uh, we uh, started the show, I got uh, some information, some articles sent to me by other priests from from around the world. And this article had to do. I, I don't have the article in front of me. I should, I suppose. There is a. a a man who's uh, been appointed by the United Nations, uh, something to do with the dignity of, of, of human beings or, or some sort of a category. Anyway, uh, they are trying to get it passed in the United Nations that any religion, listen to this, any religion that would call uh, homosexual uh, actions sinful, uh, would be uh, subject to fines and any ministers of those religions, priests or ministers, would be uh, uh, open to be to be uh, arrested and jailed. Wow. I, this is this is kind of incredible. And what I find what I find amazing is that right now the Vatican seems to uh, to be in line with that. This is a, I find this a little bit scary, Robert. I do. Yeah. Well, there's no doubt that for for a century, if not if not for many centuries, the moral teachings of the church have been objected to by many powerful and uh, influential people, and uh, one of them was Henry VIII, who uh, wanted to divorce his wife and have an heir through a, a second wife. And uh, John Fisher and Thomas More said, that's immoral, you, you cannot, a marriage between a man and a woman is forever. So the church's teaching on marriage has always been a high. Yeah, I remember, and, and Thomas More and John Fisher have a title before their name, which is saint, right? Yeah. And Henry VIII, he doesn't have a saint title, does he? No. I see. Okay. I just wanted to make sure of that. Well, we laws and, and uh, customs, of course, uh, determine uh, actions and determine uh, patterns of life in society. And we've had a great debate for 50 years during my lifetime, really, I've seen it, of uh, coming out and of having acceptance for what prior to that was regarded as something that was harmful uh, to the society and to the people in such a way that um, it shouldn't be embraced and, uh, and supported. This has been regarded now for 50 years increasingly as a, um, as a position that we no longer should take. And uh, I don't want you to interrupt you from from your thought. Um, no, no, no. I'm just, I'm just saying that you know. I understand what you're saying. I've heard this for years. I've heard this for years. The point is, we can sit down now at a synod on synodality, which I'm, I still think is, uh, I, I, I'm still. Uh, <laughs> struggling to understand a synod on synodality, right? However, we can do that, and we can we can determine then what is morally correct, and we needn't take into account uh, sacred scripture, tradition, and uh, the teaching of the magisterium up to now for two thousand years. We don't. Well, we, is, is, that what we're, is that what we're talking about doing? Can we yeah. do that? Can we do that, Robert? Well. You've asked the question that is on everyone's mind, and this is why people are wondering, are we going into apostasy? Are we being misled? Or have we been somehow unable to understand something for all these centuries that the modern period has come to understand? 
And there's been an enormous effort spent to argue that second point. People have said that we didn't understand the scriptures. They've said that uh, Paul's very clear teaching against homosexuality was not really against homosexuality, but only against uh, idolatry. Idolatry. That was the, uh, the argument made in the 1980s by John Boswell, who was a professor at Yale University. And I actually knew John Boswell. And I actually uh, felt that he had uh, tendentiously misinterpreted the scriptures, even though he was no doubt a brilliant man. But he wanted to change the teaching, and he argued for it. And uh, for the past 30 years, the arguments have simply expanded and extended as the entire society in the West has tended to embrace this position that some type of sexual uh, preference is innate, that it's given as it were by nature, that it can't be something that is chosen, and therefore that it can't be something that people would. Well, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's very interesting, except that for years when I was in New York, stationed in New York, uh, I, I worked with a, a group called Courage. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm telling you, these were some of the most outstanding human beings I've ever met. I, I, I mean it. They were incredible. Um, many young men and young women who are, I, I, I don't like the word struggling with this. They're not struggling with it. They're living with it. Uh, it's a cross. Yes, it's a cross. But they're living with it, and they're living with it uh, quite successfully and uh uh, and, and giving a fantastic example to many people, uh, uh, they're using they're using their free will. They're not saying everything is predetermined, and so we have to go that way. What I'm what I'm frightened about is, and it's not just a question. It's not just this moral question, not just this one moral question, but that a group of secularists, and as we as we know. Uh, traditionally, the secularists were called Freemasons, Freemasons, Gnostics before that, everything. It's, it's, it's all the same thing. It's all the same thing. Uh, a group of secularists are now putting forth that if I would say that there's something wrong with this behavior that, that the church has always considered, and, and Judaism also, before, long before the church, immoral, I can be put in prison. That's that. That's pretty amazing. That came out today. Yeah. That came out today, and this is where they're going. And you know what's what's even what's scarier yet. Everything that I'm hearing from the left is is coming from a dictator. It's coming from. It's being dictated. It's not being voted upon. It's not being discussed. It's not being. Uh, there's no election. No, it's there's a, a. It's a. It's 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 coming from a dictatorship, and it's going to be so that so that I mean imagine imagine we can no longer maintain Catholic teaching on different subjects because we would be we would be responsible or guilty of. Hate crimes. Well, it's incredible. It's incredible. Yeah. Well, this has been coming up for a number of years, and it's thought that it will occur, that the church will follow the same path that Jesus followed, and that as his teachings... But do you see the church following the same path that Jesus is following? Well, in this sense, that it will have a passion, that it will be rejected. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I see what you're saying. Yes. Yeah, in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it says that our belief is that the there will be a time in history when the Church will pass pass through a passion similar to the passion of Jesus, leading to his scourging, to his rejection, to his condemnation, and to a decision finally to execute him. Do and, you remember? Do you remember that quote by by Cardinal George of Chicago? Yes, 
I knew Cardinal Georgi, and I remember. Go ahead. This is no, no, no. I, you, I, I, I just, I would say, I would say it incorrectly. If you know it, go ahead and say it, please. Well, what I recall, he was looking out, and someone. How did the he, thing? He, he said. He said, things are coming to this. I, Cardinal George, Archbishop of Chicago, will probably die in bed. Hmm. Right. You, my successor, could be jailed. And your successor would be put to death. But yeah. the beliefs we hold. Well, this, that's what Cardinal uh, George of Chicago said. And he was a very thoughtful, very learned. Yes, he was. And I, uh, I spoke with him on a number of occasions, and uh, he believed that the church was going to be challenged by the secular world to change her teaching. And what he said was, if we remain faithful, we will be rejected by the world and condemned. And uh, he thought this process was far along. He passed away peacefully a few years ago. And uh, he, he, in other, he died in bed. Yeah, so he was yes. that, that far. He's correct. Yes. Um, I, you know, I, I think we are right on the turning point here. Finally, of these questions, we've been approaching them, and I think they have been indicated uh, by prior popes. John Paul II said we are going already back in the 1970s. He gave a talk because they could see even then that ideologies had emerged of terrific anti-Christian nature, uh, yes. both, both in Nazism and in communism. And in the red Soviet areas, they had arrested and executed just dozens and dozens of bishops, priests, thousands of people, maybe millions, over the years of the Soviet Union, because they wanted to remove this teaching, this gospel, but also this morality from human experience. So they did so. And the fact that we continued as the Christian West to resist this and finally outlived it, surpassed it, suggested in the 1990s that we might, in a sense, triumph. But something happened with the embrace of the culture of death the embrace of a kind of uh, secular, humanistic worldview that wanted to reject the sacred and the transcendent, that led us to the impasse where we now find ourselves in 2023, nearing the moment when the traditional teachings will be condemned in the West. And either the church will go along with that, which it seems some people want to do in this upcoming synod, in October, and under the leadership and uh, sort of shepherding of this new head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Up until now, the heads of the congregation, or now called the Castery uh, for the Doctrine of the Faith, would always draw a line and say, we can't, even though a theologian is free to try to draw out of the teaching some possible ways of developing that teaching in one or another direction. But we have to judge whether it's become false or, or wrong, and we call this false. The question will arise now if we, if we have these, uh, this synod and then uh, some more conservative or traditional Catholics will say, we're going too far here, we can't make this change, it's not in keeping with the teaching of Christ, the, the question will arise then, what will the doctrine of the faith say about it? And so we now have a man in that post who is a little more um, modern and open towards some of these modern tendencies than the prior uh, prefects of that office. You think so? You think, you think he's a little bit more modern? Yeah. yeah. He's written many things about the, the necessity for the church to adapt her moral teachings to the, uh, the new scientific information the world has gained, et cetera, et cetera. I, I, uh, day before yesterday, 
read uh, a, a good deal of his book on kissing. Remarkable. Oh, well, you, should, you should explain what you mean by that. <laughs> he wrote a book on kissing. It's a, a, a very strange book. Very strange book because it's it's a, a half poetry, half fantasy uh, on the art, sort of the art of kissing. Yeah, I think it's called the art of the kiss. Well, it can be the art of the kiss in Spanish. It's the art of kissing. Okay. All right. Uh, so it's the action, not the not the not the noun. Uh, very strange, very strange. That I, I, I've just never I've, I've never had a, I've never heard of, the, of a theologian writing on such a subject and in such depth, such depth. But anyway, yeah, I think I think we're in for a, I think we're in for a, a, dare I say it? I'm going to say it a showdown. I think we're we're in for a showdown. I think we're going to have very soon uh, the the uh, that confrontation that actually Pope Benedict spoke about too. Yeah, uh, he he spoke about it quite 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 openly. He said the church in the future is going to be much smaller than what it is today. Much smaller. Well, what is he talking about? The the uh, the liberals, the liberals are going to be smaller. I don't think so. I think he's talking about the the people who hold on to the 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 fullness of the faith are going to be much smaller. There was there was something too. I put that in I put that in my book uh, on the on the the, the Godmother. I, I brought brought this up on other programs, and I'm and I'm not sure if I brought it up here. Mother Pasqualina told me of of the the time that Pius XII came in from being in the garden and told her that he was blessed with a vision of the miracle of the sun, the dancing son of Fatima. The vision was given to him personally in the Vatican gardens. He watched the sun. He saw the same thing that the sun did in Fatima in 1917. And Mother Pasqualina said to him, she was amazed and he was amazed, he was shaken. This was right before, by the way, this was right before he was to proclaim the dogma of the, of the, uh, the assumption. Yeah. Thank and you. so Pius XII took that as the Blessed Mother and above all God's uh, affirmation of that, of that dogma to be pronounced, right? And the Blessed Mother being pleased with it. But Mother Pasqualina asked a very important question of him. She said, and did, was there a message in that? Hmm. All right, you saw that you saw we call the dancing sun, the miracle of the sun, as it's described by the by the seers at Fatima, by 70,000 people who saw this, by the way, right? Mm -hmm. And many of them, many of them atheists, and some of them atheists and Freemasons who were reporters there, yes. right? Right, yes. And they reported this. Anyway, after all of this spectacle in the in the garden, and he was still sh shaken from that, she asked, was there a message? And the, she said to me, the Pope answered with one word. And that word was apostasy. Yeah. Apostasy. That's all. That's all that was said. Uh, and, and Mother Pasqualina said to me, she said, I ran to the dictionary. <laughs> I ran to the dictionary because I wanted to make sure I thought I knew what it meant, but I wanted to make sure that I knew what the word apostasy meant. And she said, that's, that's, that, that's what it is. And she said, now you, you have to understand this. This is 1950. The world was absolutely perfect for us Catholics in those days. I mean, we talk, we talk about it as the golden age of Catholicism, especially in the United States in Canada and in many parts of the world, there wasn't any hint of apostasy. But this is what this is what was told. So when I heard that story, I remember being very impressed by that. Very impressed because I was already seeing in the 1970s things that were leading toward that apostasy. They were they were they were things were moving in that direction. And I think we're very, very close, very, very close right now to to a declaration of that by oh. one way or the other. Anyway, one I, I, I agree, and I think uh, 
that's part of the reason why this synodal process during during this pontificate and especially during this synodal process on the synod on synodality has been carefully designed to provide the context for I suppose what will be presented as a legitimate development of Jesus love and uh, his mercy and his caring for people for wounded and fallen people and inviting them to full communion and uh, excuse me yes Robert I'm, I'm with you up to there but let me just interject something inviting them to full communion without repentance shall we yeah. say that Without repentance. I mean, let's be very clear on that, because this is what's been absent in this pontificate from the beginning. Yeah. God loves you just the way you are, just the way you are, just the way you are. We don't need to convert anybody. We don't do this. Everything is fine. No repentance. Excuse me. That's not what Christ said. I, I, I too, have read the scriptures, and so have you. And we know very well that that is not what he said, and it's not what he meant. I don't need I don't need theologians to tell me yeah. what he meant. I can read it myself. Well, I think we should explore this question of a personality which is addicted or is um, somehow in need of what we might call grace. Or uh, oh, we, 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 we'll take one second here to talk about this pilgrimage, and then come back to this question of whether this repentance that we're speaking of is something that people are capable of or whether grace is required even for any repentance. And uh, just think about that for one moment. As I mentioned, the fact that we're going to have a Zoom call to talk about four different pilgrimages that we will be having in the next month we're just pulling them together because we ourselves want to visit these places. We want to go to Lourdes and Garabandal, and we want to uh, try to understand what happened in Garabandal from first hand. We want to go to Lebanon, the, the, the country which is a message to the world of the possibility of people living together, but now seems on the edge of breaking apart. We have a project in Lebanon to support the Lebanese Catholics. Then we're going to go to uh, Budapest and Rome at the right after the Synod. And then we're also going in the winter to come to where you are, Father Murr, and have some days with you to discuss and to reflect, to pray together and to have some meals together, which I think you are prepared to cook for us. I, as a matter of fact, I just I just came in, cleaned up real quick to be on your program. I just finished cooking for uh, barbecued spare ribs. Nobody had had them here. And they thought they were fantastic. I said, this is what, this is a, what they eat in Texas. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, and uh, we're going to have a Zoom call for prospective pilgrims who can raise questions and talk to us about this. And if you want to join that call, uh, send your email to us uh, in the chat board or... Uh, uh, click the this this link below, uh, pilgrimages at insidethevatican.com. Send an email there, and uh, we will keep track of your email and contact you about how to get more information on these planned pilgrimages. Now, it's clear that we have a society that has sort of collapsed the metaphysical into the physical. There, it actually has already apostatized in a profound way that you you said you speak the truth you speak the truth it's already happened yes yeah. we don't actually if we get right down to it have much belief in the spiritual in god in the afterlife that we live after we die in uh redemption uh the world is practically and pragmatically agnostic or atheist. And um, the 
context within which we are living, therefore, is one in which we're walking through the ruins of a philosophical architecture, which is now crumbled all around us. And the beautiful thought of Thomas Aquinas and of, uh, the spiritual exercises of Ignatius of Loyola, all these things are increasingly uh, re make sense and are attractive to a, a very special and rather limited group of people who have longing in their hearts for the infinite, for the eternal, for the holy. And therefore, somehow, either the church, for what, I don't, I actually, I would like to know, and I'm thinking of trying to write about how all of this occurred, and was it the fault of the church? Were we too focused just on buildings and just on external things? And did we not argue the philosophical and theological debate? We did not argue sufficiently and uh, eloquently enough. But what I think is clear as we approach 2023, where we, we are now living, and we look into the 2030, 2040, um, as these, as the apostasy increases and our faith in the eternal and the holy diminishes and is eliminated, we no longer believe human beings have souls. We are just chemicals. I think there's a devaluation. We're also, we're also, coming, we're also coming to believe, you're talking about the spiritual. Yeah. We, we do not believe, we do, I, I, I believe and you believe, but the world does not believe that human beings have souls. Uh, let's let's remember also that the world is is beginning that the world has already arrived to the conclusion that the human being has no dignity. Yeah, we're already at that point because when we're talking about killing people and killing more people to make room for other people, and this uh, no, we're not talking about anything. Even the natural virtues, the the supernatural virtues. Yes, I agree. They're lost on, on an incredulous world, but also the natural virtues have been lost. The natural virtues have been lost. Yeah. So looking at it from that perspective, um, we know that Jesus looked out and uh, said uh, uh, he wept, actually. Uh, he saw the misery of the people. And I think as we look out, in spite of the affluence we have, there's a deeper misery. There's a loneliness. There's a meaninglessness. There's a, a kind of resort to uh, to chemicals, to uh, painkillers, to sleeping pills, to uh, all sorts of other drugs. Therefore, I think objectively, there is a disease of the spirit, which under the guise of giving us freedom, and making us absolutely free to take and do whatever we want, we're being led down a dead end to misery. And somehow the message of Christ could lead us back toward blessedness. And the battle now is over precisely how to turn toward the world and say, we have a message that won't lead you to misery, rather than turn towards the people and say, we just embrace you in your misery. And therefore, I, I'm thinking there needs to be even a deeper reflection than anything up until now on how to go about our task. I, 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 find, it, I find it absolutely um, repugnant that we would say to the world, we embrace you in your misery. Because what we're also saying when we say we embrace you in your misery is because we're miserable too. This is the problem. And we're not miserable. Believers are not miserable. I, I, I don't know how, I've, I've told this to, I get, I get, I have contact with a lot of people. I don't know why, but uh, I do. And, and they're, they're asking me, they're asking me so many times, why are you so happy? Why are you, well, I don't know. Why are you so happy? I'm, I'm a Christian. Why wouldn't I be happy? I mean, I, I don't run around laughing all day. I'm not talking about that, but I'm, I'm content with life. I'm content with, with where I am because I know who I am in the economy of things. I know where I stand. I know who God is. I know who I am. 
I know what my responsibles are toward him. Uh, I, I think if you forget who God is, which is an easy thing today to forget because you've got all sorts of distractions and temptations to pull you away from even thinking of the question. But when you know who God is and, and where you fit in God's world, not where God fits in your world, where you fit in his, uh, and you follow through with that, how can you not be content? How can you not be content? And I see no one or very, very few uh, people in the world today, worldly people who are content. They're, they're all, they need more. They need more. They need, uh, they need more power. They need more money. They need more sex. They need more affluence, influence. Uh, yeah. Nobody's ever, and nobody's ever happy. Yeah. And, and I think as, as Christians, we're happy. Yeah. We're and happy. In, in fact, I, I, I hesitate to, to bring up such sad things, but they're true. It's as if on this journey towards self-fulfillment without God, people have broken all taboos and gone uh, not only to satisfy their passions, they've started to be very, very cruel toward uh, toward others. And I'm thinking of this film that's just come out that was prepared by Jim Caviezel about the sex yes. trafficking trade, yes. which includes the trafficking of children, which is increasingly being sort of poo-pooed and not so serious in, in a way that is horrifying. How could our society have gone so far down this path? And how can, how can we be in a place where somebody would take, when somebody would, confronted with such a theme would say, "Oh, uh, don't be bothered by that," or that there, there's nothing there. Don't worry about that. Yeah. Are you but, kidding me? This is th this is where we're at. You know what? I go back to to Jean Jacques Rousseau, who I dislike very much because I find him an absolute hypocrite. His his life was incredible. His life was incredible. He was Catholic when it was convenient to be Catholic. He was Protestant when it was convenient to be Protestant. He was an atheist when it was convenient to be atheist. And unbelievable. But he came to the conclusion that what was wrong with human beings, what was wrong with human nature, were the institutions, schools, the church, uh, fraternities, uh, society, civil governments. All of these things were corrupting men. If we were just free of all of them. Well, you know what, Robert? We are free of all of them. Today, modern man is free of all of that. And I don't see him happy. I don't see him content at all. All right. So I think what we have talked about with Pope Francis now and the leadership of the Catholic Church and the process that's now underway toward preparing the October Synod, which certainly will have something to say about the church's moral teaching and the authority of the church to continue to teach what it has taught for 2,000 years, therefore proposing a break with that teaching, no matter how carefully they try to phrase it. We're on the edge of apostasy, and we're on the edge of embracing a non-Christian secular worldview and we therefore must pray and work and write and speak as eloquently and thoughtfully as we can in order to try to bring good out of this very dangerous situation. What do you Absolutely. think? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, 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 uh, no, I'm not going to say any more. We'll save it for another program. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll save my, my remarks for another program. Well, you, could, you, you could give us a, a concluding remark. We're almost Well, I'll give you a concluding remark. Here's, yeah. here's, my, here's my impression of the, of the, of the, uh, the upcoming uh, consistory. I think, that the, I think that the Holy Father has left very little up to the Holy Spirit. I think he has left very little up to the Holy Spirit. I think, I think he's gone ahead with putting people in 
to 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 uh, to vote to to guide the future of the church, all who are in agreement with him. I've never seen this in a pontificate before, Robert. I've I've seen popes who had they had they had real enemies, <laughs> not enemies, theological enemies. Let me put it that way: that nobody wanted to kill anybody, but. Uh, Pius the Twelfth had had some cardinals who were against him. John the Twenty Third had some. They they were a mixture of people. I've never seen everyone. Everyone has to be the same in the in the same uh, the same theological mentality. The same uh, uh, it's the, in in the exact same mold. This I've never seen anything quite like it. Okay. I've never seen anything, that's, that's that's what I find very scary. And what I'm telling you. I, I see very little room for the Holy Spirit. I mean that. Oh, what, you, what you just said is that there's less diversity than there was. Well, this, this is the irony, isn't it? We're talking about diversity. We need diversity. We need diversity. Well, where is the diversity? Excuse me. I don't see the diversity. I don't see one person in, in the people who were named who would be who would be who would even possibly give permission to a priest to say the, the Tridentine Mass? Wouldn't wouldn't happen. Where's the diversity? I don't see anyone who in, in the in the in the people who are nominated as, as for, to, to be up and coming cardinals who are in any way different than the man who named them. I, I just find this I find this kind of scary. I really do. I, you know, the, Pius the Twelfth, John the Twenty Third, Paul the Sixth, Paul the Sixth named men who were he didn't agree with. He didn't agree with, but he knew that they were absolute believers, and he knew that they they had brilliance in theology and philosophy, and he knew that they were of conviction, right? And I mean, this is this is this is amazing. I just find this amazing. Well, scary. It does seem as if the church is uh, passing or entering a phase here of great danger. And um, therefore, all the more reason to return to, uh, to prayer and to, to try to study and uh, to try to, uh, you know, repent and re <laughs> re re repair our own lives and work with those around us and uh, therefore be ready for this upcoming struggle over the over the truth and over the tradition of the church which is and you're saying you're saying it in one way robert and let me be a little bit more specific and also to frequent the sacraments especially confession and the holy eucharist especially 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 constantly never never leave Never give up on those, on confession right. and and the and the Eucharist. Uh, those will sustain. They'll sustain us as individuals and as members of the church. They will. So, Father Murr, it's always a, an honor and privilege to speak with you, a friend of Cardinal Gagnon, the author of a report that we are asking uh, Pope Francis to make public. We are. Uh, making that one of our uh, goals as we proceed forward these coming weeks and months. And um, very close friend also, mysteriously and providentially, of Sister Pasqualina, who was the Secretary Pius XII, a man of great uh, experience. Appreciate having you, and I'm looking forward to our next discussion as we continue to prepare now for really the, the debates that will come in October. Thank you, Robert. Always a, always a, 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 a privilege and, a, and an honor being with you. I mean that, you know that. We have Lady Rotha with us from the Isle of Man. She writes, wonderful as ever. Thank you, gentlemen. Before I die, I want to go to the Isle of Man, Robert. Why don't you organize a pilgrimage there or okay. one that includes the Isle of Man? That would be great. Would you come with us? It's intriguing. I'll, I'll go. I'll go as your chaplain. Sure. All right. So, Lady Rotha, please contact us whether you could host us. <laughs> whether you can host 20 people. <laughs> All right. And we're hungry. <laughs> so we're, we've got started in some type of a community here that's 
trying to preserve the tradition and faith of the church, along with many others. And we're going to do our best to continue. So thank you, Father. All best wishes. Thank you so much, Robert. God bless. Until next week, God willing. All right. Join us this September on an unforgettable pilgrimage to Lebanon, the land where Christ walked. This is a pilgrimage you won't want to miss. We'll taste world-renowned Lebanese cuisine, drift through underground grottos, and explore the monasteries high above in the mountains and in the deepest valleys on our way to an encounter with the miracle worker, St. Charbel, in the land where Christ walked. Join us this fall, September 16th through the 25th, 2023.